I think we got one of your buddies in the house there, uh, Jake, ACI Aquaculture. That might, that, What's up, that, Chris McAleen? That might be Chris. And he, he told me, I, I was talking to Chris today, and he told me to ask you a question on the show tonight. So maybe, uh, well, maybe I'll just blurt it out right now. He, he, sure. he, he kind of, uh, I know we, uh, we had a conversation about um, the name game, and he said you had some uh, pretty, uh, pretty strong thoughts on the name game <laughs> in terms of naming corals. All right, you need to set a timer so I don't get lost in the rack. Give me, give me five minutes. I'm not even kidding. I, I care more about the coral actually is. What is it actually, right? Because the reason I'm an asshole, and I'm sorry, but I am an asshole when people call them ACAN lords because they have not been ACAN lords for like six, seven years now. And the reason I'm really jerky about it and I don't let it slide. I just like just call it a lord. You won't. Co- it's because if you put a lord next to an actual a can, you will end up with an a can because it will eat that lord like that. You learn something by knowing the difference between a cycloceras and a fungia. They come from vastly different environments. They have different care requirements. They come in different colors. They reproduce differently. Like you are, you know, when you were talking about how does someone get started? That's what I'm saying. Like, don't read anything because there's all these names thrown Mm -hmm. about. Like people, the the hobby overall has not even come to a collective understanding of how we name a freaking coral, right? And it's gotten so much worse because you have the Dunning-Kruger effect where people have been in the industry, the hobby for five years, for 10 years. They think they've seen it all, you know? And so like they'll go around and slapping names. Let me... Pull out two examples, really good examples. So the, 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 the hobby in general, except in Europe, in Europe, they actually call things what they are to the best of their ability. But in America, man, it's like Looney Tunes, Disneyland all <laughs> over the freaking place. And uh, it's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. I've been to some of these, you know, uh, fancy coral vendors and places and had some beers with them and dude behind the scenes they don't remember what name they threw on this or that coral but on the flip side it's also the consumer is also to blame because when i worked at unique corals we would put up mariculture mariculture colony of let's say just a small millet you know like three four or five branch slits you know about this big uh put it up for 90 bucks no name no sale you just you just come up with two stupid adjectives and you make it a little bit smaller and you can't keep them in stock. Yeah. People feel like they're buying into a club, but two examples of, of coral naming that has gotten out of control is one is the weeping willow leather coral. Hmm. I have seen the weeping willow is my coral. That is mine. <laughs> don't, don't take that away from me, man. That was my coral. <laughs> For 15 years before I told anybody about it, the only person who has any is Sanjay. Maybe I shouldn't say that because otherwise I got to be hitting him, and, hitting him up for that. Well, <clears throat> he's not a coral vendor. No. Me. And I did give Remy from Bahama Lama. I gave him my blessing to call his weeping willow. I mean, to be honest, it should be weeping willow style, but I've seen that name just like overnight. You know, I said only my friends knew about the Weeping Willow leather coral. Weeping Willow was a name we you first applied to thin branching Sinularia soft corals because their branches would droop mm-hmm. over in slow flow and like literally look like a Weeping Willow. And that's why the Weeping Willow sarcophyton got its name because when you turn down the flow, the polyps, not the branches, they, they fall over the crown. Um, the coral nursery in, in uh, Kentucky just took the name. I don't even know if they know what the descriptor came from. Um, Aqua SD had their name, had the weeping willow on something. Some random coral vendor in New York just threw it around. Um, and this was the worst one. Uh, sorry, Stephen, but Top Shelf Aquatics has an ORA weeping willow, which is the same <laughs> large polyp Micronesian sarcophyton that has nothing to do with the weeping willow. I have another long polyp leather coral, extremely long polyps. It is not a weeping willow. You turn the flow off, the polyps stay like this far up. They're just as long as a weeping willow, but they don't fall over. So that's one where I'm just like, either we agree that we are going to stick with the 
Latin names to the best of our ability. <clears throat> or we agree to con confer and concur on some of these trade names for corals that are special and deserve it. But no one's doing that. If you know what, every time I come up with a coral name, dude, I just do a little quick Google search of dot 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 coral, and there'll be three different corals with that name on it: Hellraiser, Hellfire, Firestorm, Firestarter. It's just like there's not even any creativity to it. No, I mean I I remember you know in terms of like some of the old school corals that um, you know first came out that had the names like the Tyree Purple Monster and the uh, I rebuke you. Oh, it's um, not. It's not. It's not Tyree. Tyree. Okay, right. That was. Uh, I, I get. I get what you're yeah. saying, Ray. But Tyree had so little to do. I mean, Tyree had. If it wasn't him, it would have been someone else. And so he was very influential in starting that trend. I mean, I remember reloading Reef Farmers. Uh, actually, I remember DynamicEcomorphology.com before it turned into Reef Farmers in like late '90s. And you know, it was cool. It was fun. It was clubby. But when it was small, and everybody could kind of keep track of what was what. And, but the purple monster, you know, someone in the Solomon Islands went out to the reef, collected it, shipped it, brought it in. They did the work, right? Yeah. Uh, definitely take uh, umbrage to people just throwing their name on a coral they discovered. You don't discover corals in Los Angeles. You don't discover <laughs> them in Detroit. You don't discover them in New York. You discover them on the reef. So as far as I'm concerned, the only people who can really put a name to a coral is Vincent Chalius, who's actually farming this stuff. Right, the people that are picking them out of the ocean. Yeah, and some of those classic strain, you know, the Langside cap. It didn't even need a name. It's the cap, the purple rim cap that came from Langside. Very descriptive. Purple monster, still, like, to me, one of the coolest, neatest corals of all time. Or the green branching cap. It didn't have a silly name. It was a descriptive name. I feel that way about Euphelius today, where you cannot yeah. even keep – dude, there is five – thousand new names for different slight strains of torch corals right now and they're throwing the names on freshly imported corals that has no bearing on the strain great example i bought my dragon soul as a holy grail and then a Two years later, there's a holier grail, but instead of calling it the holier grail, which would have been funny, you know, worldwide corals influence basically kind of eclipsed what other people were calling the holy grail, and they were calling that the dragon soul. But now I've refused to play that game. It's an orange torch coral with green tips. <laughs> yeah, what's up with anemones too? I mean, like a Colorado sunburst anemone. What's uh, I mean that that is a pricey anemone. It was funny. It's like I've been growing the Colorado Sunburst for about 15 years, and I still remember a buddy of mine. Like I know the whole story, like top to bottom, who discovered it, the first guy who grew it. I saw the first grow out tank of it. Dude would not let me take a picture because he didn't want to know how many he had. It was only like 40 in a 180, and he had two or three rose bubbles in there, and the rose bubbles looked dull. It was crazy. Um, but I remember the first guy who told me about it locally, he said, oh, yeah, we've got this really cool orange sunburst or, or no, sorry, orange bubble tip because it wasn't a sunburst. We're calling it the sunburst and we're getting three hundred dollars each. And I was like, you are crazy. No, I don't ever pay three hundred dollars for a sunburst. So locally they were they were about three hundred locally for like 10 freaking years. And, you know, so for certain strains that have a proven track record of being cultured in the aquarium hobby, they do deserve a name, you know. And it was at a reef stock that one year just, you know, things were just a little bit higher demand. And it went to 600. And then the next year at reef stock, um, it was Reef Koi, who's been around the hobby for a mm -hmm. long time locally. Um, somebody had somebody else had just thrown a sticker out there for $1,800 and sold it like that. And it's really frustrating that a lot of the value of the corals is from speculation, you know, like the right. rainbow tenuous that are happening right now. <sighs> I don't want to get into that, but let's wrap up the coral naming with one coral. There is no such thing as a purple stylophora, which isn't the Milka stylo. Mm. The Milka Stylo 
For those of you that don't know, haven't been to Europe, Milka is a popular brand of chocolate, and it comes in a lavendery purple wrapper. Lav- you know, so it, it means something. Milka Stylo. That coral was grown out in all throughout Europe for like 15 years before Ore got a piece legally. You know, just they, they did a small shipment or something. I don't remember. And uh, then it got distributed into the Reef Aquarium Hobby. And if you go out and look for purple stylos, you will find as many names as there yeah. are coral vendors. I've seen people put Sanjay's name on it. And first, that coral is so special. And if you don't know the real name of it, you don't know the entire history of it. That is the only stony coral in the aquarium hobby that is from the red freaking sea. Oh, really? Think of all the corals we have. 90% of them are from Indo, from the Coral Triangle. Let's just call it Coral Triangle. Ve- and then more recently is Australia. And then a very small amount from Central Pacific. That is the that is the only stony coral of its kind from the entire Indian Ocean. Like we get some from the west coast of Australia, which is technically all Indian Ocean, but to me that's still like Australian. But yeah, that coral's been in captivity for 35 freaking years. You will never see a wild purple stylophora that was collected in the Red Sea or maybe right outside of it by Jean Jobert. You know, you know the Jobert mm-hmm. plenum system? Yeah, yep, yep. He, he collected that in the late 80s, I, I specifically. And that was grown out at the Musée Oceanographique de Monaco. Uh, the Monaco Aquarium, basically. It was grown in the Jobert, the first Jobert plenum tanks, like 10 years before it got spread out to anybody else. So if you don't know the name of the coral, then you don't know this super rich history that's associated with the purple style flora. Everybody just takes it for granted that it's a thing. I remember seeing it in France because I've been to Europe many times. I remember seeing out the over there and getting parts of that story before we even had any varieties of of style for us. So with, when it comes to the name game, like, I mean, people need to put their foot down. They need to figure out what we're going to do for, for a naming. Um, okay. I, <laughs> um, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's gotten completely out of hand. I think the prices are, are insane. I think there's, there's some corals out there. There's a couple, um, that I've seen that could be worthy of the hype and, and the, uh, and the name, I, I guess there's some, um, the rainbow splice coral out there is a pretty badass acropora coral and uh no it is a pretty badass looking photo of a coral have you seen one not in person have you seen one this big have you seen one this big is it all pink is it all green is it crazy swirly like you think it will be i don't know you haven't seen I don't that know. coral yeah you know what yeah. i mean so when it comes to grafted corals i have i wouldn't say terrible experience because they grow and they're fine but one color takes over the rest mm. Like for some of you that keep maybe like some house plants, uh, very similar thing as the variegations, and you have one of two things happen over a long period of time. Either the variegation takes over, and the leaves become all white, therefore the plant cannot photosynthesize and it dies, or the variegation gets outgrown by faster parts of the plant. So you have to maintain a balance of green versus white leaves or half green and half white leaves. So if you want a high maintenance coral that you're always going to be fragging, that's great. But you and me, man, we're a little bit old timers. I like a colony from across the room. Same thing with every single one of these rainbow tenuous. I collected rainbow tenuous. They are the least impressive corals from two feet away. I, I, I am in the same. Um, I'm the same uh, ballpark. I mean, I I love brightly colored corals that you can see at a distance. So I love I love pink bird nests. I love pink bird nests. I love um, purple pink styloforas. I love the green ba- the, the green valley slimer. Um, I Bluetooth I do style. like the um, the Oregon. I think I pronounced that right. I always pronounce Oregon wrong, and I get a lot of crap for it. But uh, the fine. Oregon Blue Tort is probably my favorite coral, and it is a named coral, but I think it's just... That one deserves it. Yeah. There's never been another coral imported to the aquarium hobby that has last, you know, 
lasted the test of time like the Oregon tort. We know where it came from. Obviously, it didn't come from Oregon reefs, right? It's just one of the first places it was discovered. When you see an Oregon tort as a frag, as a colony, as a colony, it always looks the same. But to me, I got it all over the studio. But to me, a reef tank, you know, the way I treat a reef tank in terms of an SPS dominant reef tank, it's it's kind of like a canvas, and I like I like to paint, and I just think about in terms of the um, you know the different colors in that tank and what it's going to look like from across the room or from a few, a few feet away and a virtual five virtual high five there you go 